After 17 years at the helm of Tomasek, Ho Ching will retire on October the 1st. If you need to do last-minute shopping before Chinese New Year, well, be prepared for big crowds and long queues. Back in Singapore after 10 years, Tesla is offering its Model 3 electric cars at what observers consider competitive prices. Welcome to The Big Story, coming to you live from the Straits Times newsroom. I'm Olivia Kuei. I'm Harian Tudiman. You can subscribe to the Straits Times channel so you never miss a single episode. Ho Ching will retire from her roles as Tomasek Holdings Executive Director and Chief Executive on October the 1st. The 67-year-old will also step down from its board on the same date. She'll be succeeded by Dylan Pillay, who will continue to concurrently hold his present appointment as CEO of Tomasek International, which is Tomasek Holdings' commercial arm. In announcing the change, Tomasek Chairman Lim Boon Heng also paid tribute to Madam Ho. When she took on the CEO role in 2004, Tomasek's portfolio stood at $90 billion, mostly in Singapore. Since then, it's tripled to over $300 billion. Under her leadership, the group set up Tomasek Trust and Tomasek Foundation as its philanthropic platforms. And most recently, Madam Ho made it to number 30 on Forbes' list of the world's most powerful women of 2020. So, three days to Chinese New Year, mm -hmm. Olivia. Are you done with spring cleaning and you know getting your CNY goodies stocked up? I am done with spring cleaning, mm -hmm. yes, check. But uh, as for the CNY goodies, I haven't... I found you know, some, you, you yeah. and I have bought it together at the canteen yeah, upstairs, yeah. but I am still lacking my favourite goodie, bakwa. Ah, and you know, speaking about bakwa, right, uh, Olivia, let's take a look at the long queues outside of Lim Chi Guan Bakwa at Jewel Changi Airport. This morning, a line began to form at 8 a.m. and there were about 80 people when the Straits Times reporters dropped by. Now, people generally observed a safe distance from one another in the queue, which splintered off to a second queue on another floor. Well, a similar scene as well at Lim Chi Guan's flagship store at Newbridge Road, where 75 customers were queuing. If you're wondering why Lim Chi Guan was so crowded, particularly today, it opened its stores yesterday to walk-in customers after all its barbecued products were sold out online. It will continue to sell its bakwa until tomorrow or while stocks last. Meanwhile, wet markets like in Coven, Chongpang and Potong Pase also saw huge crowds this morning. Well, this despite a cap to the number of customers allowed in the market at any one time. Safe distancing measures didn't appear to be observed in some queues. When ST visited the Coven market and food centre at 10am, there was a queue of about 250 people from the market all the way to Coven MRT station. Customers said they had been queuing for between one and two hours. ST was also told that National Environment Agency officers were managing the crowd inside the market. Now, when ST reached Chongpang City Wet Market at 9.30 a.m., there were about 95 people in the queue. About six crowd controllers were ensuring that customers adhered to safe distancing measures. Inside, ST saw a safe distancing ambassador patrolling together with a crowd controller. Let's check in with infectious diseases specialist Dr. Leong Ho Nam from the Rufi Clinic at Mount Elizabeth Novena. Doctor, welcome back. Now, Doctor, you just saw these pictures from earlier today at the wet markets at Coven and Chongpang. Perhaps it's worth reiterating how we can enjoy a safe CNY. First of all, I'm going to give you guys a face palm moment. <laughs> I mean, seriously, seriously. Look at the queues, look at the crowds, look at the distancing. There's not even one meter. You can probably punch each other out easily. Okay, at this rate, okay, not just at Chongpang, but anywhere else, we do see so much people, so many people. All these crowds are exactly what the virus is looking for. The virus wants to hit one of them and infect one of them. And if you look at the cap pictures, I'm very sure you can spot one or two who weren't wearing the mask properly with the nose exposed. So Singaporeans, I know you all have COVID fatigue. You hate the mask. I totally get it. But until we are well vaccinated, we need to be really, really vigilant. Even when we are well vaccinated, we re need to remain vigilant. But we slip up, 
the virus will pick up. It will come to us, haunt us, and then it's going to be CB2 again, that circuit breaker 2. Right. Well, thanks for weighing in on that, uh, Dr. Leong. Before we let you go, though, we just want to talk about the Indian national who received his first dose of Pfizer's COVID-19 vaccine, yet was among the two community cases reported yesterday. He took the vaccine on January 27th, then tested positive on February the 5th. How could this happen? And does it put the vaccine's efficacy into question? If you look at the dates, 27th of January to the 5th of February, you're talking about 10 days. And the vaccine takes into effect only at about day 12 to day 14. So most experts accept it as day 14. So it's kind of four days off. Now, it's not to say that the vaccine is inefficient, rather the timing is wrong. You need 14 days for the antibodies to build up and in turn confer some protection. So coming back to him, what happened to him, it was really coincidental that he ended up the exposure and ended up having the vaccination. The timing was just wrong. It's literally us trying to catch the bus. We missed the bus by four days. When you miss the bus by four days, you miss the protection. If he was exposed four days later, my friend, we would have prevented yet another COVID infection. So guys, those people who are due for vaccination and have not done it, okay, look out for it. If you are caught, please don't hesitate. Get yourself vaccinated. Get yourself protected. Right. Well, we always appreciate your insights, Dr. Leong. Thanks so much for joining us today. That was Dr. Leong Ho Nam, Infectious Diseases Specialist from the Rofi Clinic. An update on the COVID-19 situation here. 11 new cases were confirmed today, all imported. 10 have been placed on stay-home notice upon arrival in Singapore. The remaining case is a cabin crew with Singapore Airlines who was on a turnaround flight and had not disembarked from the aircraft at the overseas destination. She developed symptoms a few days after returning to Singapore. Well, in other local headlines, a 33-year-old radicalized Malaysian man has been arrested and deported to Malaysia for planning to travel to Syria with his Singaporean wife to take up armed violence for the ISIS terrorist group. Muhammad Firdaus Kamal Inzam was arrested under the Internal Security Act last July. The Internal Security Department said today that there was no indication he had made any specific plans to cause violence here. The man's wife, who was radicalised by her husband, has been placed on a restriction order for two years. She's a religious teacher and her teaching accreditation has also been suspended. A private funeral attended by about 20 family members was held today for Jethro Poir. He is the 15-year-old ACS independent student who died after an accident at Safra Ishun last week. The cottage left Singapore casket at about 11.30am and arrived at Mandai Crematorium at 12.10pm. Jethro's father gave a eulogy at the wake and said he and his wife were proud of how their only child had lived his life. In other news, good news if you're looking to get your hands on a Tesla here. Tesla's Singapore sales portal has gone live a day after the Straits Times' senior transport correspondent listed estimated prices of its cars. The site states that one of Tesla's most popular cars, the Model 3 Performance, will retail at around $155,000 before COE and $113,000 for the less powerful Model 3 standard. They are substantially lower than what parallel importers have been charging. Observers said Tesla's pricing is likely to propel sales, given that at current COE rates, the Model 3 standard range is likely to be cheaper than a Toyota Camry, but with more bang for your buck. In case you missed it, the Straits Times has a new investigative series called Close Up. Its first episode, Insta Sex, has over 100,000 views on SG's Facebook and YouTube since it premiered last week. The episode tells the stories of three young girls who are publicly sharing their experiences about being preyed on by sexual predators online. Well, netizens on Instagram have commended the girls for speaking out. This user gave kudos to them for the courage to share their encounters as well as ST for shedding light on this issue.
The sentiment was echoed by others who thanked ST for bringing it out in the open. Well, we're joined by the team who put this all together. Enterprise editor Lee Xue Ying is here in the studio. Now connecting virtually our education correspondent Amelia Ting and multimedia journalist Rachel Quack. Now before we talk about the Insta Sex uh, episode, sharing, tell us more about this new investigative series. Okay, um, so um, ST Close Up is um, a new investigative documentary series by The Straits Times um, in which we go deep into an issue and try to tell it in, we hope, uh, an interesting and compelling way. Um, it is a video format, so it's a very visual way of storytelling. Mm. Um, but ultimately, what underpins it is um, good old-fashioned journalism. Mm. You know, we've checked our facts, we get the full story, we get the different perspectives in. Um, so for Close Up, we look at um, a wide range of stories. We might be looking at um, stories that generally go under the radar, whether it's issues of people who do not usually get a lot of attention, or we might be looking at issues that people are talking about, mm. but we tell it in a different way. Um, so for Insta Sex, what we what we want to look at is the hypersexualized world of social media for Singapore's uh, young teens and children. Um, to be honest, this is really nothing new to many Singaporeans, um, probably under the age of 24. But what we want to do uh, this time is to, and to do it differently, is to really showcase the story of three girls who bravely stepped out mm. to tell us their stories and their experience of being preyed on by sexual predators online. Mm. Right. So we just had a teaser from Xie Ying. So let's bring in Amelia and Rachel to talk more about the making of this Insta Sex episode. Amelia, Rachel, what were you hoping to highlight in this episode? Yeah, so the first point that we thought um, was important to highlight was this um, this trend that you know social media is getting more and more prevalent among younger Singaporeans, which um, as Xie Ying said, is not entirely new. Um, but you know, in recent years, we read now and then um, in the news of sexual assault cases, court cases, and sometimes uh, these cases could originate online. Um, it could be in the form of like stranger uh, DMs, direct messages, or sexual grooming. Mm -hmm. And you know, looking at this, we wanted to bring, up, bring across a greater awareness that uh, some of this sexual harassment online can happen to anyone uh, who has a social media account, whether you, uh, you know, whether you list your account as private or public, and sometimes um, you know, the cases can end up even in physical uh, assault. Um, yeah, and, and something that I also um, have been quite struck by as I speak to uh, teenagers and young girls, especially for um, stories on this topic, you know, that is while shocking um, to a lot of us as adults and to a lot of educators and parents, um, a lot of our young teens have come to accept or mm. have become slightly desensitized to uh, this sexualized culture that we see online. Um, they think that you know sexual messages, overtures, these sort of images that they get um, are very, in their own words, like normal and, and, and they become in a way numb or resigned to receiving such messages. And because of you know, this um, attitude or this thinking, they don't want to make a big fuss out of uh, you know, such behavior and they think that you know, it, it might be even prudish to to call such behavior out, and and in some in many cases, they actually don't talk to their parents about um, what they encounter online, what they see, or what they even experience. Rachel, what about yourself? Uh, what were you hoping to highlight from uh, this episode? I think the one thing we got out of talking to these girls is that uh, social media is addictive. So it's very hard for, I would say, young generation to give up social media completely. So I think our general Asian parent response is to tell them to, you know, uh, shut down your social media. But I don't think that's the right way to go. The biggest takeaway that I hope audiences, uh, especially parents, see is that not to ban your children, but to guide and to have conversations with them about maybe the disturbing things or even interesting things that they are exposed to online. Uh, but the one thing that uh, struck me while making this film is talking to men about toxic masculinity and how um, such cultural behavior is even easier to do it online because they are behind the screen, you know. So um, a lot of the guys, they talk about how, you know, actually growing up, they are clueless and they are confused on how to approach girls. 
So they turn to media and often it's advertisement, porn, and it's often um, they see girls in, you know, in a very different, in a very sexualized manner. So they're pretty mm. much acting out what they see in the mm. media. So a lot of them said it would be nice to have conversations with girls on how they can uh, interact with them better online and even offline. How did you go about uh, finding the profiles of these three young girls? And in doing so, what were the challenges involved? Was it like, you know, and how did you manage to get these teenagers to speak publicly about what happened? Or is it, a, and how did you also, I guess, prepare them for potential backlash after the episode aired? Actually, for the three girls, um, the, the conversation you, you saw on the video was not the first. Um, it was, you know, it was part of a longer process of getting to know the interviewees, getting them to open up and um, also checking in on them quite regularly to just, you know, have a chat. Um, and I think what was important also was to empathize with the experience. And, and you know, when I meet them, it's not just to take down notes or to ask questions for as a reporter or for your story. Um, and we know that we asked a lot of them, um, given how young they are, and you know they had to relive their uh, traumatic experiences they, and and it was also quite harrowing for for some of them to have to look through their uh, laptop hard drives and phone folders to mm. to retrieve images and screenshots of conversations and have to reread all those um because mm. it was not nice at all and, and i think for that's why we were from the start honest with our motives for what you know this video project was all about so showing what other subjects will be tackled uh, in future episodes? Right, um, the next episode will be, uh, it's called Migrant Burden. And it's actually about the lengths that migrant workers go to in order to secure a job here in Singapore. Mm -hmm. And it's helmed by um, correspondent Yuan Sin and it'll be landing in the next week or so. So please do look out for it. Well, Shaying, Amelia, Rachel, thanks so much for coming on the show to share more about this new close-up series. You can watch the Instasex episode on the Straits Times' as Facebook and YouTube channels. In the global headlines, COVID-19 testing has collapsed in Myanmar following mass protests by doctors and healthcare workers against the military coup. The number of daily tests reported late yesterday stood at just over 1,900, the lowest number since December 29th. This compared with more than 9,000 a week earlier and an average of more than 17,000 a day in the week before the February 1st coup. Meanwhile, Razor co-founder and director Lim Kaling is selling his one-third stake in a joint venture in Myanmar that has ties to a, to a Virginia tobacco company, which is the military-linked market leader in Myanmar's tobacco market. An online petition begun by activist group Justice for Myanmar had urged Razor to remove Mr. Lim from its board if he didn't end his business ties with the Myanmar military. Hong Kong media tycoon Jimmy Lai was denied bail by the country's top court today. The Apple Daily owner had been in custody since December 3rd, except for when he was released on bail for about a week late last year. He was brought back into custody on grounds that the previous decision had an erroneous line of reasoning. Well, those are our top stories for today. For more news and videos, visit straightstimes.com and subscribe to our YouTube channel by hitting the red button below. Once again, I'm Harian Tudiman with Olivia Kuei. Join us tomorrow for more stories on A Big Story.